Hi, it's Susan from World Peaceful, and I'm going to talk about my day today because it was quite a, an amazing day, unexpected in a lot of levels. It started off, I was a bit sad this morning. I was thinking about my father, and I was thinking about family, and you know, the family breakdown. And it was sort of upsetting me. But also the aloneness in the path that I've walked. You know, it's been a hard path, let me tell you. And I was sort of going through that, just how hard it had been trying to create peace education programs and not having money, not being supported. And the very many people I'd met along the way who, who really um, didn't work with me, you know, those also interested in peace too because I have a lot to give. And I, I have a calling in the peace area. It's a calling. It's not wishful thinking. I dreamed I was teaching peace, so... It's a very powerful driver of my life now. I'm just going to take this off a little bit because it's getting hot. That's a powerful driver too. <laughs> hot flushes. <laughs> I get them a lot. I've had them over a few years now and you men are lucky. You don't have this problem. You just get really hot. It's like really intense hot and then you, you sweat and then you have to cool down. It's unbelievable experience. It's called the change of life when you're in your 50s. So it's something for the other girls to look forward to. You'll love it. <laughs> but you don't need a heater, although I've got one on. <laughs> so the beginning of the day started um, actually quite sad and unsupported. And I also am doing a lot of research, so I'm getting overwhelmed at times because I'm really looking at world issues. And I'm also... There's a grieving process in this research that I'm doing about what's going on around the world because many people will be asking, what, what is this all about? Well, I have actually found answers as to what, what it's about. And there's a grieving in that for me. You know, it's like, it's, it's almost, it's hard for me to believe that people think in the way that they do. I'm a peacemaker and, you know, I would never go out of my way to hurt anyone. And you don't have to be a peacemaker to be thinking in this way, just not non-violent. I'm just not violent. I get upset and angry like anybody else, but I don't have the intention to harm. It's not in me. So when people say that peace is an idealistic notion or peace is unrealistic or you get military planners saying, oh, well, you know, it's an ideal but we'll never have it, well, that's untrue and I know it. I know that that's untrue. And certainly I doubt they invited peacemakers, those who have calling it, I'd, I'd put forward, not those necessarily calling themselves peacemakers. No offence to them, but you have to come into alignment with the real inner peace if you're really serious about it. And whilst there's a good intention around people who are in the peace area, they haven't really dealt with a lot of their own issues. And, you know, I'm certainly not at that point where I've dealt with it all. I'd probably put Byron Katie as probably one of the world's uh, peacemakers, definitely, on a global scale, she is. She's got a Christ consciousness without a doubt where she no longer has fear, she no longer is depressed, she lives in a state of grace 24-7. That is a peacemaker. This is someone who's awakened. Not everybody's at that point of awakening, I'm certainly not there, but I have moments of it. Eckhart Tolle is another who's awake. These are people who have had peak experiences in their lives. They've literally awakened. He also was depressed. He was uh, um, going to Oxford, I think it was. I think he was, uh, he was at Oxford. I remember him talking about meeting Stephen Hawking, who was the famous physicist. He was in his wheelchair. And this guy had cerebral palsy, like he was you know, unable to control his motor skills. And it was Eckhart Tolle coming through the door and Stephen was being wheeled and he had a couple of helpers around him because he couldn't even feed himself. This is a world-famous top scientist, you know, in the League of Einstein. This man continued with science even though he was losing all motor skills, unable to control his body, but his brain was fine. How many people are locked in bodies when their mind is fine? But the essence of what Eckhart was saying was he saw joy in Stephen. And it surprised him to see such a happy soul. Because Stephen was doing what he was here for. 
which was science. His disability wasn't a disability at all. It was just an experience he had. It was a way of life. So Eckhart Tolle, he, he himself was wanting to end it. Many of the, the ones who awaken have actually wanted to end their lives. It's not uncommon. What Eckhart said was he came to a point of realisation where he said, I cannot live with myself anymore. And then suddenly the thought comes, well, who is the I that can't live with me? He recognised two. We're not talking split personality. This was consciousness recognising itself. So he said that when he said, who is the I I cannot live with, that's when he awakened. And then, and then that, of course, fell away because there's only consciousness. The I is the ego you know, I can't live with. Well, I can't live with myself anymore. So I think it was the higher self. It's really interesting. It would be interesting to know more about that. <clears throat> anyway, so these are teachers of peace, just a couple of examples. There's been many, uh, Jesus, Buddha. Um, there's been enlightened people, um, I think Babaji, don't know much about some of the others, uh, but there, there would be those of equivalence that are awake. No fear, fearless. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about my day because I met amazing people. And what I find quite often is whenever I have a bit of a, a downer, so to speak, I, don't, I never stay long in it, but I definitely have it. Always something good comes, it's like, I have a very strong sense of that higher power, if you like. Some call it the I am presence, some call it God, some call it nature. Whatever it is, I certainly have a strong connection to it. And it's love, a uh, feeling of love. So that um, idea of self-love is actually an awareness that you are love. Everybody is. So anyway, I thought I'd go out for a couple of hours and and then when I got to my car, it needed a bit of cleaning. So I was looking for the duster to try and clean out some of the dirt. And then I saw a lady and, you know, she was walking her dog and I just jokingly said, oh, my car, I'm giving it a bit of a clean. I said, you know, it's been very muddy lately. And her and I just entered into a conversation. And this is what I love is these random meetings. And... You know, I told her a bit about, you know, my life and because I'm in emergency housing at the moment. I've been homeless for two and a half years and for the most part without income. It's only been recent times that I've actually had income because I went on off study because <laughs> I'm studying. And I probably had more money than I've had in a long time. I might just premise my conversation with her by saying that I've actually felt an abundance because they've been giving more money. So for me, this this time of uncertainty has been certainty for me <laughs> but I've actually had the reverse experience to everybody else in that I had no money and then now I've got lots of money and I'm actually buying myself things I'd never buy you know and food you know actually buying food that I really like I'm not doing it a lot I'm still still you know careful with money because I would you know when you've lived in poverty you become very careful but I'm really loving that I can do what I need to do. It's, it's and I thought, why can't they give more with Ostad with um sorry Centrelink? Why can't they give more money with New Start and the pensions? Because that sense of abundance is what actually makes you makes you feel good, and you're more likely to feel you've got a future, particularly if you can afford to rent. You know, it's just ridiculous to be kept in this state of poverty all the time. But clearly there's different mindsets going on here, some that are seeing it as we're going to force you off, make it hard, but it, it, it's not like there's an abundance of work out there. There's not. And everybody's facing different stages in their life. So, look, that's another narrative, and I won't go into that. I will go into the discussions I had today because I had some beauties. So this, what this lady was telling me that she had been an animal activist, so a liberationist. I learnt about what they call sow, not pens, what is it, sow stalls, she called it. 
And I said, what's that? And she said, it's when they put a pig, a female pig, in a tiny little stall that literally goes around it and it lives in that. It's not unlike the, um, the concept of battery hens, the concept of what they used to call Collins Street Farmers, you know, where they have all the cattle in pens. Um, there's no grass. They don't get to roam free. And I just might throw in a thought that came to my mind was apparently where they've incarcerated, so you all feel like you're under incarceration under COVID-19, but the poor old cows, they get... Far, they're not they're not farmed from a free range situation. They're all in pens. It's dirty. They don't get to run around. They're basically grown from meat. Like they're, you know, tomatoes or something. These are animals that have feelings. It's funny how those who farm them don't understand that. They don't, they really don't see it. But anyway, I saw some footage of some cows that were, were freed. <laughs> free i'm free at last moo <laughs> they literally frolicked they jumped up and down and frolicked happiness <laughs> was what the cows felt because that's their true nature and this this whole business paradigm of linear factory like farming because they want to they've got their it in there and they're working it out to the nth degree we need this many cows at this point so we can chop them up and make this many you know, I don't eat meat, so I can't even remember. Chops, <laughs> chops, sausages, whatever, whatever they're making. It's incredible. So she was saying to me that she'd been an activist and she'd been hassled. She said she'd been bullied. People had, on the road even, um, hassled her, come up really close, being abusive. I went, really? And she said to me that, some legislation had been passed to make it a crime. And I don't know if this is true, but it's what she said. A crime to take a photo of inhumane, cruel treatment to an animal. I said, you're kidding me. She goes, no. Um, she said it's a gag order. It was a form of a gag order to silence the activists. And I said, well, that's incredible. So but we're getting that with freedom of speech as well. This idea of criminalising the revealing of crimes. So your whistleblowers. These people are being suppressed for revealing crimes. That's got to be concerning to every citizen when that sort of decision is made it really casts a huge light on those creating those laws. So we sort of talked about things like that and we talked about the coronavirus and, you know, just the restrictions on people's liberty. She was shocked herself at the extent of it. And I heard on the radio today actually that there had been anti-shutdown activists in the city here in Melbourne protesting and I heard a few of them yelling um, through the audio that they were broadcasting and I thought to myself they probably saw footage of other protests because I've heard about it I'm not watching tv because I don't I, I don't subject myself to mind control I believe that the television um, is a certain projection of ideas and I want to think my own thoughts. I don't want to be governed by other people's repetitious narratives. So that's why I don't watch TV. I also want to be happy too. And I, you know, a lot of it's negative, so it doesn't attract me. But nonetheless, I heard this on the radio. So you can't quite get away from media. And apparently some police were a bit heavy handed with some of the protesters. Not thinking about the police. I have actually sought in the past to engage with the police. Um, it was when I was emceeing at the Alternative G8 many years ago. And one of the people that was attending this Alternative G8 
This was a form of social empowerment. This was people talking about global issues in actual fact. They had breakout rooms and they were coming together in response to the G8 meeting, which is a high-level meeting of the world leaders. So this is civil society attempting to have a voice and it has no voice is the reality of it. But the decisions that are made are impacting civil society, which is why they are seeking a voice. So they're educating themselves through these gatherings. Now, apparently someone got picked up by the police, and I know this to be true because I know of the person who, who told me the story, and they were taken down the police station. And it was a, it was a case of mis uh, the wrong identity, wrong person. But they were humiliated. Um, and it was that situation that motivated me to make contact with the police via Rotary, because I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow. And the idea was to, what I was hoping to do was to have a mediation, uh, not really a mediation, probably more of a group conflict resolution session between activists and police in order to help make protest or, if you like, civil society, police relations more harmon harmonious so that they get to know each other rather than typecasting these others as protesters or, you know, placard waivers, because there's some really strong prejudices around the civil right to freedom of speech, which is actually a safety valve in a society. It's very important. When I studied peace studies at La Trobe, I had one of the foremost lecturers in the subject area. I was actually an expert on Gandhi. And he was saying that it's absolutely critical that people have a, an outlet to express their dissatisfaction with things that are impacting them. And that's understandable. We, we set up mediation because people are having conflict over something. Conflict's part of the human condition. But unfortunately, what ends up happening is, oh, you know, you might get agent provocateurs in there who create problems and then it looks bad on the protesters or there could be protesters who become violent or there could be police that become violent or police get caught up in something. You know, it's, it's a situation that can explode if people don't know how to manage it properly. So my approaching of the police really was to open a dialogue. I wasn't really with the protesters. I was able to come in a more central position. I knew them, but I wasn't involved that much with them. I sort of, I, I sort of, in the way I work, is sort of pop up here and I pop up there, but I don't really belong to any group, is the truth of it. I tend to move across groups. So I offered senior level, I went straight to the top, and they didn't take it up. I even written a, wrote a proposal and I explained why I thought it was important. Because th this person who was taken from the street, they weren't treated very well, and it was the wrong person. And this person was definitely a peaceful person, they certainly weren't violent. And so they'd made a mistake, but there's no apology or there's no um, compensation for what they put the person through. You know, this inequality, this this um, discriminatory treatment is not the way to go. But we're kind of cha challenged through these mindsets, you know. You've got the mindsets of the, the civil society who are very upset with things that are going on at high levels. And then you've got the police trying to maintain social order or social control. In some cases, it depends on the nature of the police force, whether they see themselves as a police force or a police service, because there is a difference. You know, the old bobbies in England were, I think, a very good model for policing because they got down on the community level and got to know people. So her and I, you know, we sort of talked a little bit about her activism and actual fact. I told her about, you know, being a peace person myself. Because there really are a lot of misconceptions around um, activism. What it really is is people who believe that they've got a democratic right to speak up. They're not even really activists, even though some of them do organise. They're really people who believe they have a right to say something. And that's been sorely challenged right now, changing legislation with raids, you know. So there's people really watching the government quite closely. Um, there'll be a lot particularly down here in Melbourne because that's where most of the activists are. 
So when I'm hearing about them protesting the shutdown, I understand. And there's huge questions around the shutdown. I'll just go there now. Huge questions. From a global perspective, we shut down the entire planet for on a health basis with a coronavirus that they're saying, certainly from the information I got from the Prime Minister, and I'll repeat that again, it's a mild virus. It won't harm the majority of people. Now, that's a very important point for people to really sit with. Those who are likely to either contract it or die from it, well, people in the mainstream can contract it, but let's just say those who are likely to die from it are those with compromised immune systems. So the coronavirus clearly is a virus that can lead to death if you've got a very weak immune system. So the elderly and those unwell would have to be extremely careful. Now, one of my discussions with this has been if we're looking at a risk management graded chart going from high risk to um, medium risk, moderate risk, low risk, however they choose to group those, the degree of risk. The way I see it is a high risk categorization has been imposed on the mass of the public when the mass of the public are not at high risk it's actually a low risk that's the concern here because if we're talking about public health public health is not only those who contract virus it's those who become socially isolated because people have been, you know, instructed to stay at home, to go out for only four reasons. And that then makes it extremely scary for them to go out on any other level. So there's a, these fines are a form of intimidation. Now, the other side of that point might be, well, it's for their safety. Yeah, but people are not going out to help someone who might be suicidal. So we've got a health risk there. If a person's at risk of killing themselves, that's equivalent to someone who's vulnerable with the coronavirus and they look like they're on death's door, as far as I'm concerned. Same deal. It's a health issue. So the, the massive, you know, problem that happens when you isolate people and then you also ruin their livelihoods by collapsing the economy because they can't go to work because of the fear of a virus that may or may not be a reality on the ground. So the fear is what's driving all of this. It's not only the fear, it's also following other governments. It's also other bodies like the World Economic Forum doing their practice run on a form of coronavirus pandemic in October last year, that has to be put on the table. How on earth did that happen? Why would a world economic body be looking at a coronavirus or a pandemic like this? Now, there's issues around that in respect of disaster capitalism. It's what I call predatory capitalism, where events can be orchestrated in order for corporate entities, they're typically multinationals, they're not small to medium-sized businesses. They don't do this because the big ones have the power. Now, events can be orchestrated where they make money out of that disaster, and it's been documented that they've been doing that. We've seen it quite typically and on a far, fairly big scale in the war zones, such as Iraq, where they sent private security companies went in there who were protecting assets, I would imagine, who made a lot of money out of that disaster. There's also issues about the orchestration of those disasters. So that's important for the public to understand the proportionality of the decisions that were made in respect of whether 
the shutdown, a massive shutdown of entire society and global society is proportionate to the actual risk on the ground. I found out today that we're only looking at, what, 97 cases of deaths. That's nothing. Where in May, the influenza kills between 1,500 and 3,000 a year. So that number to me, even if we're taking it as a half yearly statistic, is not much. If that statistic was accurate that I heard today, could be higher, I don't know, because I'm not watching the news. But nonetheless, there's still, you know, there's, there's social, psychological, social, emotional problems of isolating people was a really big issue. And then we've got domestic violence, which they know about. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of, extenuating health risks with the shutdown itself and is that is there the case that more people have suffered or died as a result of being isolated and I know that social isolation I mean this morning I was feeling it when I had a cry I was feeling the isolation I live alone anyway so that that kind of came up for me today um I also want to talk a little bit about Eckhart Tolle who I was listening to, his audio is well worth having a listen to. It's it's the new earth. And it really goes through egoic thinking. So what I'm going to do with this talk that I'm doing right now is I'm going to blend a lot of subject matter, inclusive of the people I met today, because I met quite a few. And I'm, I'm just going to try and make this video reflective of these influences that happened to me today. And this becomes then a reflection so Eckhart Tolle, I had listened to, our, you know, earlier today, talking about the ego, and I've been contemplating the war mindset again because I'm looking at some research on belief systems from high-level planners who, were, who came to a conclusion that war is um, necessary from an economics perspective, that there is a very strong belief in that because of the manufacturing of weapons and as if the economy is the only thing that you focus on, forget about morality and all the rest. But, you know, and even when I say that, it's not surprising to me that they would ignore morality and really seek peace. I mean, it's not surprising to me that they wouldn't because you have to be able to agree with the murder of people and this is what it is. It's make no mistake. It's murdering people. It's using social violence. It's organized violence to achieve an objective. That's the real words here. I mean, Scott Ritter, when he spoke here in Melbourne many years ago, he went through the ugliness of war, how disgusting it was. He's a soldier himself. But he came to the, the viewpoint that it's absolutely necessary. Well, I disagree with that, completely disagree with that. It only becomes necessary when you're in or creating a war of tooth and claw because you've cultivated a consciousness of fear and violence and giving it a justification. There's also the heroism component with it as well, that the hero comes out after the great fight. So Eckhart Tolle was talking about war as a mindset and the ego driving that violent mindset. He also talked about the war on terrorism, the war on drugs. Well, we've just had our war on the virus and people have even talked about, you know, we're fighting this. And as soon as he hears those words, you know, I'm, I'm against this, he knows it's, it's, it's going to fail. You know, because the, what you fight against, what you resist persists, what you look at disappears. You can't fight against anything. See, because consciousness in governance, business, right across the society is at a certain level. Some could argue it's unconsciousness that we're actually dealing with here where people are so used to established patterns of behaviour because they've been trained and there's not critical thinking coming in around it. They really believe they're right and they they completely are in agreement with what's been taught them. They're not critically appraising the outcomes and going, well, is this really true? 
there's a form of unconsciousness. You slip it. We all do it. We slip into unconsciousness when we don't question anything. So we've accepted that war is necessary. Everyone has, and yet innocent civilians are being killed in these settings. And we've found out that what's been driving this has been either oil, there'd be some monetary incentive that's created the, the context. Now, what I was going to say was in respect of the governments and business and what have you in, in relation to consciousness is they're not aware of the law of attraction. And if they are, they don't understand it. So what you think about, you bring about. What you focus on grows. So if we want to stop war, which I don't necessarily think is the objective of of power, I don't believe that. I think they actually want it. They do not want peace. It's clear. Because when you really want peace, you will you will have to take a good hard look at yourself, which means weeding out all those negative thoughts which have justified the harming of another. And the irony with this mindset is that at the local level, you get arrested if there's any violence, you'll go to jail. But on a international perspective, there's an acceptance of mass social violence when you've got armies, and particularly when they go into civilian areas where 90% of fatalities is happening. So 90% 90, 90 of deaths in this setting are civilian. Now, if we were to tally that up against the coronavirus health emergency, shut down the entire planet, I think we'll find that the statistics were higher in the war zones of deaths. But yet nobody makes the step across to why aren't we acting on that? The virus becomes more personal because anyone can get it. But in a foreign theatre of war, we don't feel threatened, so we don't worry about it. And that's the disconnection. This is the separation, which is this egoic consciousness that Eckhart Tolle speaks of. The person is not the ego. The ego operates in the person. He calls it a sickness, a dysfunction. I think that's true because the moment we look at another party, and we judge them or we put them down or whatever we do, that's coming out of us, not them. We've made a judgment because we've not questioned our thinking. We're right, they're wrong. How do we know that's true? Everyone jumped on board with the, the, the uh, war on terrorism. But we find out now that there were funders coming from the very parties who were orchestrating that narrative. That they were very much actively involved in the creation of the very problem that they say they were at war with. That means there's an orchestration of violence, but there appears to be no judicial consequence or war crimes tribunal to try crimes against humanity. This is a real issue when we're talking about large scale. Now that violence can be overt or covert, it can, they call it weaponization. So a virus can be weaponized if it's a bio weapon, if it's been manufactured in the lab, which certainly some of the, from the research I'm certainly looking at, it has been created, this virus. The patent funder was the Gates Foundation, if this information is accurate. Certainly looked at, there's a patent number. There's, it's being corroborated by other sources too, I'm noting. So I can only go on that. The Pyrrhite Institute are the patent holder of that. And I think regardless of what actually happened, there needs to be a conversation around the world about whether anyone should be allowed to patent any organism. This genetic modification, this creating of viruses, which they're typically been using in 
agriculture. So this is the agribusiness. This is your big multinationals again, genetically modifying in order to maximise yields. How does that new agent introduced into nature impact the natural systems and the tipping points? Because nature has been configured over 4 billion years. Natural selection has selected the most hardiest species, which is what we wind up with today, is those species who have survived. Because as environment changes, the genetic array is favoured or not. They survive or they don't. And this makes species resilient. This is the resilience. The actual resilience in truth is the appropriate genetic configuration which is in harmony with the whole. So nature predisposes natural selection or the hardier species on the basis of that one that can that is adapting through its genetic structure to changing conditions in nature it's in harmony with it now when we humans tinker with the building blocks of life for commercial reasons we're not doing it for the highest good of the planet we're not doing it for advancing civilization research to improve ourselves, we're doing it for the benefit of a few who are making money out of it. And that intention is the very seed, if you like, that I would call a terminator seed. That's the actual problem. Because the thought pattern there is not in harmony with the whole. It's seeking out its own best interest to maximise its own profit. And that's the flaw in the economic system that does not harmonise with the natural system. That is why we're having ecological massive shifts happening because we as a species are not in harmony with the whole. We're not living natural lives. We have far too much materialism. We're sinking under our own weight. We have unhealthy food. The fast foods are filled with sugar and salt in order to addict people. This addiction is, I would say, um, has been developed as a strategic advantage in the commercial field because they want repetitive sales, so they addict you one way or another. Same applies with the IT devices. They're all based on addiction, particularly the iPhones, the, 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 binging, the ringing of the phones, constant notifications. You keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. This is operant conditioning. You have to be mindful of this. So our commercial reality is very much out of step, but, you know, we've got governments who are in harmony with those people believing that the well-being, well, I don't know if they do believe the well-being of the public um, anymore is defined by economic growth in an ecologically collapsing environment. That's an old, it's now a redundant paradigm given changes on the planet. There's also belief systems out there of depopulation on the basis that with too many people, population's got to come down and that will become the justification. I don't agree with that and I've said this before in the past. I don't consider that to be the real issue. The real issue is consumption. It's not numbers. When you've got in the first world um, one person equivalent to 70 people in the third world in respect of consumption, that's the issue. And we're out, where we're out of balance is the constant marketing stimulus to buy things you don't want. The economic system was designed to balance demand and supply, but it was supposed to be natural demand and supply. It wasn't supposed to be, although I, there has always been, you know, the marketing edge, but it was more advertising and then it became real strategic marketing. And as the whole world came on board competitively, You've got way too much product out there now. So this materialism is growing and in countries where people were self-reliant, which is actually in harmony with the natural system, they're losing the skills of self-reliance because they're being commercialised into systems that they think are progressive and they're not. We might be able to produce all these things, but if we're undermining life support systems, we're actually ending our lives here on earth in my view. 
So that's very important and that that's something that came reflective th through Eckhart Tolle but it also arose in my consciousness when I was walking through nature today as well, the importance of the natural system. So I went and I went for a drive and got myself a coffee. Ne I needed to get out because of the early morning feeling sad and I went for a walk, got a coffee, and I just ended up walking around the corner and I saw a sweet shop and it was just lots of colours. You know, I quite quite like that. Having been a clown, I like all those sorts of fun colours. It's very circus-like. <laughs> I'm always drawn. And I went past it at first and then I came back and I saw the lady in the shop and I had a feeling about her. So I came into the shop and had a chat and I asked her what she thought about what was going on. And she had a fairly traditional view of what's happening and that's fair enough. Then we got into talking about the mental health issues. And she started to cry because partner had left her after many, many years. And she was so alone and she couldn't reach out because she can't go anywhere. So I spent a lot of time in the shop with her talking through and it turns out she had the same length of time in her relationship as I had with mine. We even had the same, we had partners with the same names. And I was assuring her that she will get through it. I also tried to share with her that there are no mistakes in life, that these things happen for a purpose. He apparently was a quiet sort of man. He didn't talk about the issues. So dialogue was a key problem in their relationship. He hadn't voiced because they drifted apart because of her commercial interests and she was busy. And he felt she had lost her way because she got caught up in work. And this is actually an important discussion because those who are having this period of downtime or a change, they're really thinking about what's important in life. And in a way, he woke her up when he left her. She realised she loved him. He was the only thing that was important. She'd forgotten because she got busy. And I think there's a lot of people in that category. I don't think she's alone. But I felt deeply for her pain because I, I've been there. I was devastated when my partner and I split because I really loved him. And I felt this incredible aloneness because everyone was in couples and there I was by myself. She's feeling the same, but she can't even reach out. She, she just said that's the part that's, she's been into a hospital. That's how devastated. So I've offered friendship, of course, um, and I'm going to help her. We'll do the work of Byron Katie so she can question her thinking because it's the thoughts that make you suffer. She's imagining that she needs him and that she wants him back desperately. But what I said to her in a gentle way was, no one can ever give you love. You have to find it within yourself, for yourself. And, you know, she'd had a view that, you know, he may have met someone else and he was getting love from that person. And I said, well, so this is filling the gap. Ultimately, you've got to learn to love yourself. And I said, I've been on my own a long time now. And I really have found that peace. And I said, it was, took me a long time and I had to go through a lot. But I have to question my own thinking. And I also told her a bit about the philosophy of Byron Katie. How do you know you need someone? They're there. How do you know you don't? They're not. The reality on the ground is it is what it is. And yes, it feels bad and it does. It's terrible when it happens. But on a higher perspective, from a higher perspective, this event is meant to happen. She's here to learn something about herself. It's not about him, it's actually about her. And maybe he's the catalyst of those thoughts as to what do I really want? Who am I? Without him, I feel like I'm nothing. Is that true? Of course not. So I will help her, definitely, because she's in real need of a friend. So I will help her. And we made friends 
it was a very powerful moment. And I said to her, we we're obviously meant to meet. You know, I was very happy to meet her. So we said goodbye, exchanged, you know, contact information. And then I went and drove further, heading back to where I'm staying. And then I just, I came past this vista and this incredible view of a valley and trees and it had a huge coverage, if you like, from the height of the mountain that I was on, looking down, you could see everything. And I just, I drove past and, oh, I think I should have turned around, should have turned around. That was beautiful. So I found a spot further down and I chucked a Yui, went back. And I just looked at this beautiful vista. It was really lovely. And there was quite a few people there. It was good. They'd obviously stopped to have a look. And I thought, I might go see if I can find a copy. <laughs> that's me. Me and coffee intravenously linked. That's my addiction. I love it. Anyway, there wasn't a coffee shop, but I ended up seeing another vista on the other side of the road. And as it happened, this couple were coming up. They'd been for a walk. But they had those ski poles. And I'm going, oh, are you two, do you two do walking? Because they're in their 60s, 50s and 60s, I'd say. And this lovely lady was saying, oh, yes, we do, actually. And, and she said, my husband or partner, he's um, Swiss. And I said, yes, I used to have a, a New Zealand partner. And I said, you know, I'd say to him, aren't the mountains lovely here? He goes, they're not mountains. <laughs> And the Swiss guy smiled because he knows what mountains are. And these two are obviously done climbing. But as we sort of chatted, I found out that he'd had brain uh, cancer and he'd, he'd had chemo, he'd been through a lot. And she's, uh, you know, in the course of the conversation, I found out that he was often thinking in the future and the part, he was dwelling a lot on the past. He was not able to be in the present moment. And this is something Eckhart Tolle teaches is when you're living in the moment, you can't suffer because you're in the moment. But when you start regretting the past or going into the future, which is what happened to me this morning, then you start to suffer. But the, it's not real. It's the moment that matters. And he, his speech was still very um, blurred because of the operation but he was recovering and he'd survived. And his partner, you know, she was she was saying that was the way he was, but now he's living more in the moment and he's, he, he is a survivor. He's got through. But they like getting out in the nature. And she made a comment about the times we're in too and she said, you know, people think it's the big depression. She said, the media keep going on about that, talking it up. This is outrageous, by the way, that the media is doing this. Again, law of attraction what you think about, you bring about. So if everyone's pessimistic, economy will collapse even further. But the truth of the matter is there's abundance without an economy. I mean, I lived without money for two and a half years and I've survived quite nicely because I wasn't living in a poverty mentality. I was living in a mentality of, let's see, I was living in the moment actually and feeling positive. But she was saying that, you know, they're... they're saying, you know, she said, we've got a lot. She said, we, we've still got food. We're, we're doing okay. And she was saying, you know, I'm not, you don't see people begging on the street. And I didn't say anything about homelessness. I kept that to myself. But I got her point, which was, yes, on the whole, we're absolutely abundant. We've got a lot. And we, and it's, she said, it's to be grateful for what we have. And she said, people are starting to talk to each other. There's more conversations. In fact, this, um, another lady I met the other day told me, I've met more people in my street. She said, I didn't know who they were. She said, they were all home. So we're getting to know each other. And this lady was saying the same. She said, good things are coming out of it. And I would agree. And it's flushing out what's important in life. Is work important? Well, I work all the time, but I'm not working for money. I'm working for humanity. And I, so I, I don't need an incentive to work. For me, work is just normal. 
I work all the time. In fact, even taking today off and even doing this video now, I'm conscious of time because I want to do some work. But I want to do the work. That's vocational. And I tell you, it's a lot nicer than knowing you have to go to work, you have to get up and get dressed. I mean, I worked in hundreds of companies. I know what it's like. I used to watch the clock. So that was a really lovely um, discussion. And I talked about living on too. I talked about near death. He didn't really believe in any of that. I told him I'd seen my father in a dream and it, it was real. You know, like I actually felt it was a visit. And I know it was because I never dreamed about my father prior to his death. I, th I don't even think I've dreamed once about him prior to his death, which was just last year. I've already had two dreams with him and one's around my car because he fixed my car before he died. But anyway, I told the story to this, these folks and I don't know if he believed it, but I suppose they were grateful to share and have a chat. And uh, we talked about nature and they told me about the walking track they'd just been on, which I ended up going on. And it was just, and I just thought how lovely it is. And, and she was saying, well, so what's your name? And I said, Susan, and asked her her name and her husband, partner. And uh, it was really, really lovely to make friends with them. Yeah, it was a real nice, and they said, we're off to Audi. <laughs> As if, whoa, the social, you know, sojourn of life is to going to Audi. <laughs> I said, it's funny that, isn't it? You know, going to the shops is a highlight now. <laughs> That's got to be a miracle. But again, we're dealing with, you know, the big shopping centres, you know, supermarkets, shopping centres. They're making the money. Disaster capitalism. The poor, tiny little shops who should be open, who wouldn't, I mean, they would only get two or three people in their shop I mean, when you're looking at a big shopping area and they're going, oh, we can only let in 10 at a time, small businesses might even have one or two an hour. Why aren't the op shops open so that the poor can buy what they need? There was a great op shop in Warrandyte here in Melbourne. It had food. Homeless people were coming to get the food. They had free food for them. They got closed. So how, do, how does a... Violent video game shops stay open as an essential service when an op shop gets closed. The small shops shouldn't have been a problem because they don't have many people coming in anyway. And you would have had more spread, people would have spread out far more because they're not, they're going to all the little shops. They're moving around. And as it turns out, they're doing that now. They're restricting who comes, you know, to certain numbers. That could have happened all along. So those businesses who live from week to week, they collapse. They don't have the assets to keep it going. And even with this keeper payment, I mean, I, I, I spoke to another woman on the track. She was Asian, very nice lady. She'd been involved with designing shopping centres, funnily enough. So she's some form of possibly civil engineer or what have you, but she was obviously in a professional role and she lost her job. Big shopping centre, big, I know who they are, I won't say their name, but they got rid of them because they didn't want their, their shareholders to know what the cost of keeping those people was on, even though those shopping centres have made a lot of money. So they got rid of these others. It was a shopping, it, she was redesigning a shopping centre. So, you know, you look at the logic of that, she's now without an income. She's obviously got money, so she's all right, but she's in the tiniest little flat, she said. She had a place in Perth, tiny little flat, trying to work from home, she said, was just horrendous for her, you know, there the whole day, just going out for a, a breather on the balcony, totally isolated because she lives alone. So those who live alone, they'll be going stir-crazy working from home. You know, so there are really fundamental issues in this whole thing. But she said on the, on the positive note of that, she's rethinking her life. Do I really want to do that work? She's thinking probably not. 
She said people are trying to get her to look for work. She doesn't want to. And I went, oh, that's really interesting. I said, follow your heart. Just do what makes you happy. Very important. She was an amazing woman, very intelligent, had a really interesting discussion and funnily enough, the last topic of conversation, because we talked for about an hour, <laughs> I had really long-term discussions with people. She, at the end of the conversation, talked about George Pell, horrified at the outcome in the High Court, couldn't believe it. And she said to me that apparently the boy, the man who was a boy when he was sexually abused, apparently the mother, I don't know, I, I assume this is correct, that the mother said something, what, what message does this send the world? And I said, I completely agree. You know, this is two courts found him guilty and then the High Court doesn't. That's a big issue for Australians to think about. And now we've got the Royal Commission into child institutional child abuse releasing information that he knew about the pedophilia that was going on now you know it begs the question obviously for all those years you're knowing that pedophiles are accessing children now you either it's not possible to say that he's incompetent it's not possible. There has to be a tacit consent. And what would cause a tacit consent of behaviour that's harming children? Doesn't take much to figure it out. So there's huge issues around the truth of the matter at the High Court. That has to be, we have to have mechanisms to re-examine that because it's not looking not, not, it's not looking good when a high court releases someone like this. And, of course, we've got the VIP pedophile rings, which were raised by Fiona Barnett. She was a child who was handed around these rings, high level. United States, she was flown places. She's already outed prime ministers here, ex-prime ministers. She's also outed very high officials in the United States. She's outed them on her blog. She's also raised it in the Royal Commission against child abuse. She was horrified that nothing was done. She did a um, media interview, which I had a look at, where she's saying, I'm standing here today because nothing's being done for the victims. That means there's a consent at higher levels for this behaviour. That's concerning. That's really concerning. So that issue came up towards the end and I was just really going, wow, there's a lot of people are really concerned and I knew that. I knew that. So it was a very, very interesting day, actually, today, the people that I met. The fear of losing their voice, you know, where Australia is going. Like I, with this Asian lady, I was telling her, we had an egalitarian society when I was growing up. We had a welfare state, a proper welfare state, but what we're getting is a US-style system where everything's becoming insurance because the companies are benefiting. We're getting corporate welfare happening when that money should be going to the public direct. This has to be on the public agenda because public, when public assets get sold off, public loses all rights to those that asset. We've also got the issue of losing property rights, cashless society, automation, AI, data gathering. We, I had a discussion about data gathering today with someone. Real concerns around it. Don't want it. So I, as I've said to people, I believe this is actually really about the public and whether they're going to take back their power 
and reclaim and refashion democracy because really I see everything as unwinding. Even this whole emergency power situation, this was not an, a need for an emergency power in my opinion. There's no threat happening here. Australia, as it turns out, didn't have much in the way of coronavirus. And we're an island in any case. So why is an emergency power need to be erected? And I know from my own research that the United States government enacted the emergency powers for 40 years in order to suspend the Bill of Rights. So they orchestrated these wars to say we're under a state of emergency. And then that suspends the rights of the people. That has to be discussed. Why does a state of emergency need to be happening? Even in the fires, why does there need to be an emergency power? Can't you all just work together collaboratively? The government has, um, through its inconsistency clause within the constitution, if there's two same laws, state and federal, the federal takes precedence. Surely the states and the federal government can collaborate and work together, which is what we've seen, same messages being trotted out around coronavirus, but we need some real critique around this. Given economy has been collapsed, um, I think it's what, 10 to 20%, the US economy has had a real problem. I think that's 20% contraction, that's massive. Problem with the United States is that when people go lose their jobs, they don't have an appropriate welfare system there. Not like Australia has with Medicare and they can get some money, but because of the corporatization of governance in the United States and the influence of corporations who think that welfare is a waste of money, who don't have a social contract with the public, they would see them as not showing the required merit in order to get a job when we're clearly in economic circumstances globally, even prior to this virus, of a declining economics situation. So they're not going to be able to get work. So you put people between a rock and a hard place. They can't get food, they can't get shelter. And then they're homeless. I mean, do we victim blame them for the contraction of an economy based on decisions which need to be questioned in respect of the proportion of the response. Massive issues here, but I'm very heartened to hear Donald Trump talking about getting the country back to work. Now, there'll be, there'll be countervailing arguments here who will, people will say, we think it's best to wipe that virus out. The truth of the matter is you can't, you can't wipe any virus out. Polio is the case in point here. I'm with Rotary. Rotary worked extremely hard with vaccinations to try and wipe polio out, it resurrected. We have to be careful about the vaccinations, what's in them. The, the disaster capitalism that I brought in before, you can look at some of my blogs, I've been reading some books on that. This is where they're making money out of disasters. We don't want this type of marketing we have to find another way to live in balance with the planet. We have to find another way to live cheaply, but in a way that, you know, these are not motherhood terms in respect of dignity, respect for the highest good, because I've seen these words bandied around in a research that I've looked at for those who actually don't subscribe to a peace mindset, who seem to think that the emotional response is irrelevant, that they don't consider that in their rational thinking. Well, to be human and to be fully integrated, you have to take on board how you feel about a matter. You also have to invite in various perspectives so that you get a better picture of it. If we're highly mind identified, which again harks back to the ego that Eckhart Tolle talked about, if you're highly mind identified, you are not going to engage the heart and the materialism creates that orientation towards thinking rather than feeling. And because we've got inequality on the planet, the feminine side is often discounted as weaker. These are untrue statements. Feminine is not weaker. Her expansion of who she becomes is not 
some um, an outcome that is not wanted. Or what did they say? Um, I'm thinking of a certain intellectual here. Equality of outcome is undesirable was his statement between men and women. He looked at um, or perceived female through a religious lens. This is not how we females experience ourselves. We have an enormous potential, enormous potential and capability as can be seen through mothering, as mothers day to day. The family, the glue of our whole civilization has really been held in the hands of women. Women are the ones that have nurtured the children on the whole. They are the ones that you go to when you're upset. The mothers are nurturing the generation because the human being must have that nurturing to become a functional human. If you starve a child of love, and I'll give you an example. When I was in Russia with Patch Adams, Dr. Patch Adams, the clown doctor, Robin Williams played him in a film. What, what I was informed about was that the children become imbecile if they are not given cuddles. So these are the orphan children that were abandoned in Russia. The parents might have been alcoholics or what, what have you. They would shunt them off to these institutions, these orphanages. And I met many of these children as a clown. I, I was bringing joy into those spaces. The children were not getting the cuddles that they need, the love that they need. By the age of five, if they were not given enough love, they would become imbecile, become crazy. They would send them, them off to a mental institution for the rest of their lives. These were normal children. If the nurses were able to give them enough love, they may survive that and then move on into an orphanage with other children and they often make friends and they, they still don't get the love they need from a parent um, and the, in, the institutions are dangerous for them because there was um, criminal mafia access into these orphanages, I found out. So that love that nurturing, that caring, that morality, that values prism that's developed through felt love is the very thing that changes the way we see each other. There is no enemy. There's only unquestioned thoughts. Peace is not only possible, peace is who we are. This is not conjecture. This is truth. We are peace, but we have to unlearn all the negativity, which is really simply powerlessness. All negativity is, is all arising from the feeling that I don't have power. So whenever we go into discrimination, whenever we put power over other people, whenever we're in hierarchy, we're actually structurally creating a space where there is no power or power is diminished because someone is being discriminated against on the basis of a characteristic or their income or um, status. That is a structural and educational imbalance that creates powerlessness, which is the very seed of violence in actual fact. That powerlessness exists also in those of higher status who didn't get the love they needed from parents who were very staid, who had put demands on them, they have to achieve, they modelled off those parents. So they also hadn't, that, there's a poverty on both ends here. The emotional, social poverty from those in the upper classes, the material poverty in those in the lower classes, and, and they also suffer um, social, emotional deprivation because the parents are working too hard. So in respect of even the way we've designed our entire system, it's completely deficient and it actually amplifies the dysfunctions that Eckhart Tolle was talking about, the separation. Social distancing is not the right word. Physical distancing would be the word, not social distancing. That implies that you want people not to have contact socially with one another. That's surprising. And when we're talking about a virus that actually is mild, 
and is not at risk for the majority, why are we socially distancing? Is that a proportionate and an appropriate response? As I said in the very beginning, what if someone's suicide and we don't go near them? What if that touch, that person comes to them, no cough, no cold, no problem, hugs them, and that saves the life? Would we not choose that? Or would we get a fine for breaching a edict? Because these are not leg this is not in legislation. This is edicts. Go to a court, what, what law did I break? There is no law breaking if I go to visit my family member. It's not enshrined in legislation at this point. So I think there's a lot of questions and I've certainly raised a lot of issues in this particular video, but I'm getting a lot of inspiration and I'm getting a lot of information that's raising for me real questions around all of this. Peace is not only possible, peace is inevitable when we start to question what we fear, when we start to question the narratives that orchestrate fear, when we don't open our mind to other possibilities to solve these problems, and to also look for the good in these circumstances, because there's always good in every experience that you have. And it, it takes a lot of wisdom to extract out what's good about this. I get time alone. What's good about this? It's time for me to reassess my life. What's good about this? I'm actually exercising. What's good about this is I'm recognising I took my freedom for granted. I've got someone saying that I can get a fine for talking to someone or being with three people, taking my child for a driving lesson, playing with my children in my own front yard. These are questions that have to be asked of society. Freedoms can be removed under the guise of these sorts of matters. We have to become very clear about what's appropriate, what's not, what is truly in the public interest, what is the health impact holistically on a society with these types of restrictions and measures. Are they appropriate or not? Who are the other global players, like the World Economic Forum? There needs to be an inquiry into the pandemic simulation that the Gates Foundation funded. There needs to be an inquiry into that. Was there foreknowledge? Because we need to track back to where this virus was released, given it had no, no one had any immunity to it. We need to know exactly where it was released. Was it Wuhan? Was it created by the Chinese or was it something else? Is it a black operation? Is it a, an escape from a lab? Is it the meat market, which they, they're now discounting? People are saying it didn't come from the meat market. We have to look at this predatory capitalism. We have to investigate disaster capitalism. We have to look at the selling off of assets, government assets, public assets, and how that impacts democracy and the rights of people. We have to examine the emergency powers. Is that an appropriate use of power? Was it necessary? Many, many questions. So I'm going to leave that with you to think about. It was an incredible day, really, really great day, and I really enjoyed all those people I had the privilege to meet who were my teachers. I feel very blessed to be alive. And my love goes to everybody, inclusive of the government. I send great love to them, of course. And I really do feel it. It's, this is not me just talking. Those who are involved in capitalism, which is not democracy, it's not the same. They're two different things. Just to let people know, democracy is the sharing of power. Capitalism is hierarchical form of power, which is actually in a dictator or dictatorial form because you've got CEOs at the top telling everybody what to do. 
they tend to devolve uh, responsibilities, but they're not democratic institutions. This is why we're having issues with fascism because it's actually embedded in the structure that we call business. So we have to really seriously reassess the whole economic paradigm, particularly um, putting it up against the ecological collapse and what we have to do to change in order to rebalance with nature. And nature has to have homeostasis balancing of the feminine and the masculine. It is also about the power imbalance. We have to work towards equality on the earth because the inequality is amplifying powerlessness, which is driving all these excessive needs and wants and disgruntled feelings which can become the hotbed for violence to percolate. We want to bring people to a place where they have all their basic needs definitely met. Socially, they're getting appropriate training on how to interact with people in peaceful ways, conflict resolution. It's not hard. And I know that those in power can do this, but they're not choosing to do it. They're still on the trajectory of making as much money as they can, whether it's through data or whatever it's through. This is not going to solve our ecological problems no matter how it's marketed. The nature is not listening to marketing statements. It's only going to respond to change. So what we're witnessing with the ceasing of activity globally is that Skies are clearing, the pollution is disappearing, all this terrible toxic pollution is disappearing. It's still in the atmospherics because it's, it's got elements that don't break down. They actually are still either in plant life or airborne. We are living in an absolute toxic soup here. In the radiation is also another factor. Big, big, big issue. That toxicity is coming from the human disconnect from the heart. So the indifference to the suffering of people, the ruthless collaborations that are going on where we don't worry about the moral part that just gets in our way, that's the imbalance. And I can't reinforce that enough. I know we have to come into homeostasis if we're going to solve this. If we don't, it's not going to look good for this world because people will panic. The automation isn't the solution. I'm about to finish, but I feel to go quiet for a moment around that again. No, the automation is definitely not the solution because it's augmenting a paradigm, a mindset that's already business as usual. It hasn't shifted sufficiently. It has to shift to its inner values. I call it real hopes. Responsibility, empathy, awareness, love, honesty, oneness, peace, enjoyment and service is real hopes. That is the integration of the mind and heart. It's actually values-based prism. Until they shift to values, which is bringing back the feminine, this is not saying the masculine is not, full, not having or exhibiting values, it does, but it's more amplified in the feminine. The masculine and the feminine uniting is what brings homeostasis to the planet. So that means the masculine has to soften, has to feel his feelings and no more go into denial about the destruction he's causing. And it's not just he, there's she's involved in this now as they work their way up. So, But we're saying the masculine's in the female as well, okay? It's in, and the feminine is in the masculine as well. But the predominant orientation is masculine. That's the imbalance. The 
We have to create peace on this planet if we're to survive. And even if those who have the way, have the money, the means to go off planet, the problem still follows you. It's not going to disappear because you haven't shifted in consciousness. Another problem is going to arise where you go because we're all one. The universe is all connected. That's the true interconnectivity. It's not a interconnectivity of things. It's life force energy connected. So with that, <laughs> now I'll let you go <laughs> to ponder, ponder away. Much love. Bye.